Rebel's flag is deepest red It's shrouded oft Our martyr dead And ere their limbs Grew stiff and cold Their heart's blood died It's a fold So raise the scarlet Standard high Within its shade We live and die Though cowards flinch And traitors sneer We keep the red flag Flying Money is the real cause of poverty, said Owen. Prove it, said Crass. Money is the cause of poverty because it is the device by which those who are too lazy to work are enabled to rob the workers of the fruits of their labour. Prove it, repeated Crass. Owen slowly folded up the piece of newspaper he had been reading and put it in his pocket. All right, he replied. I'll show you how the great money trick has worked. Owen opened his dinner basket and took from it two slices of bread. But as these were not sufficient, he requested that anyone who had some bread left should give it to him. They gave him several pieces, which he placed in a heap on a clean piece of paper, and having borrowed the pocket knives of Easton, Harlow and Philpot, he addressed them as follows. These pieces of bread represent the raw materials which exist naturally in and on the earth for the use of mankind. They were not made by any human being, but were created for the benefit and sustenance of all. The same as were the air and the light of the sun. Now, continued Owen, I am a capitalist, or rather, I represent the landlord and capitalist class. That is to say, all these raw materials belong to me. It does not matter for our present argument how I obtain possession of them. The only thing that matters now is the admitted fact that all the raw materials which are necessary for the production of the necessities of life are now the property of the landlord and capitalist class. I am that class. All these materials belong to me. Now you three represent the working class. You have nothing, and for my part, although I have all these raw materials, they are of no use to me. What I need is the things that can be made out of these raw materials by work. But I'm too lazy to work for myself. But first I must explain that I possess something else beside the raw materials. These three knives represent all the machinery of production the factories, tools, railways, and so forth, without which the necessities of life cannot be produced in abundance. And these three coins, taking three half pennies from his pocket, which represent my money, my capital. But before we go any further, said Owen, interrupting himself, it is important to remember that I am not supposed to be merely a capitalist. I represent the whole capitalist class, and you are not supposed to be just three workers. You represent the whole working class. Owen proceeded to cut up one of the slices of bread into a number of little square blocks. These represent the things which are produced by labour, aided by machinery, from the raw materials. We will suppose that three of these blocks represent a week's work, and we will suppose that a week's work is worth one pound. Owen now addressed himself to the working class as represented by Philpot, Harlow and Easton. You say that you are all in need of employment, and as I am the kind-hearted capitalist class, I am going to invest all my money in various industries, so as to give you plenty of work. I shall pay each of you one pound per week, and a week's work is that you must each produce three of these square blocks. For doing this work you will each receive your wages. The money will be your own, to do with as you wish, and the things you produce will of course be mine, to do with as I wish. You will each take one of these machines, and as soon as you have done a week's work, you shall have your money. The working classes accordingly set to work, and the capitalist class sat down and watched them. As soon as they had finished, they passed the nine little blocks to Owen, who placed them on a piece of paper by his side and paid the workers their wages. These blocks represent the necessities of life. You can't live without some of these things. But, as they belong to me, you will have to buy them from me, and my price for these blocks is one pound each. As the working classes were in need of the necessaries of life, and as they could not eat, drink, or wear the useless money, they were compelled to agree to the capitalists' terms. They each bought back, and at once consumed, one-third of the produce of their labour. 
The capitalist class also devoured two of the square blocks, and so the net result of the week's work was that the kind capitalist had consumed two pounds worth of things produced by the labour of others, and reckoning the squares at their market value of one pound each, he had more than doubled his capital, for he still possessed the three pounds in money, and in addition four pounds worth of goods. As for the working classes, Philpot, Harlow and Easton, having each consumed the pounds worth of necessaries they had bought with their wages, they were again in precisely the same condition as when they had started work. They had nothing. This process was repeated several times. For each week's work, the producers were paid their wages. They kept on working and spending all their earnings. The kind-hearted capitalist consumed twice as much as any one of them, and his pool of wealth continually increased. In a little while, reckoning the little squares at their market value of one pound each, he was worth about one hundred pounds, and the working classes were still in the same condition as when they began, and were still tearing into their work as if their lives depended on it. After a while, the rest of the crowd began to laugh, and their merriment increased when the kind-hearted capitalist, just after having sold a pound's worth of necessaries to each of his workers, suddenly took their tools, the machinery of production, the knives, away from them, and informed them that as owing to overproduction, all his storehouses were glutted with the necessaries of life, he had decided to close down the works. Well, and what the bloody hell are we to do now? demanded Philpot. That's not my business, replied the kind-hearted capitalist. I've paid your wages and provided you with plenty of work for a long time past. I've no more work for you to do at present. Come round again in a few months' time and I'll see what I can do. But what about the necessaries of life? demanded Harlow. We must have something to eat. Of course you must, replied the capitalist affably. And I shall be very pleased to sell you some. But we ain't got no bloody money. Well, you can't expect me to give you my goods for nothing. You didn't work for nothing, you know. I paid you for your work and you should have saved something. You should have been thrifty like me. Look how I've got on by being thrifty. The unemployed looked blankly at each other, but the rest of the crowd only laughed, and then the three unemployed began to abuse the kind-hearted capitalist, demanding that he should give them some of the necessaries of life that he had piled up in his warehouses, or to be allowed to work and produce some more for their own needs, and even threatened to take some of the things by force if he did not comply with their demands. But the kind-hearted capitalist told them not to be insolent and spoke to them about honesty, and said if they were not careful he would have their faces battered in for them by the police, or if necessary he would call out the military and have them shot down like dogs, the same he had done before at Featherston and Belfast. Of course, continued the kind-hearted capitalist. If it were not for foreign competition, I should be able to sell these things that you've made, and then I should be able to give you plenty of work again. But until I've sold them to somebody or other, or until I've used them all myself, you're going to have to remain idle. Well, this takes the bloody biscuit, don't it? The only thing as I can see for it, said Philpot mournfully, is to have an unemployed procession. That's the idea said Harlow, and the three began to march about the room, singing. As they marched round, the crowd jeered at them and made offensive remarks. Crass said, Anyone can see that you're a lot of lazy, drunken loafers who've never done a fair day's work in your lives and never intend to. We shan't never get nothing like this, you know, said Philpot. Let's try the religious dodge. All right, agreed Harlow. What shall we give them? I know, cried Philpot after a moment's deliberation. Let my lower lights be burning. That always makes them part up. The three unemployed accordingly resumed their march around the room, singing mournfully and imitating the usual whine of street singers. Then Philpot removed his cap and addressed the crowd. Kind friends, we're all honest British working men, but we've been out of work for the last 20 years on account of foreign competition and overproduction. We don't come out here because we're too lazy to work, it's because we can't get a job. If it wasn't for foreign competition, the kind-hearted English capitalists would be able to sell their goods and give us plenty of work, and if they could, I assure you that we should all be perfectly willing and contented to go on working our bloody guts out for the benefit of our masters for the rest of our lives. We're quite willing to work, that's all we asked for, plenty of work, but as we can't get it we're forced to come out here and ask you to spare a few coppers towards a crust of bread and a night's lodging. As Philpot held out his cap for subscriptions, some of them attempted to expectorate into it, but the more charitable put in pieces of cinder or dirt from the floor and the kind-hearted capitalist was so affected by the sight of their misery that he gave them one of the sovereigns he had in his pocket. But as this was of no use to them, they immediately returned it to him in exchange for one of the small squares of the necessaries of life, which they divided and greedily devoured. And when they had finished eating, they gathered round the philanthropist and sang, For he's a jolly good fellow, and afterwards Harlow suggested that they should ask him if he would allow them to elect him to Parliament.